when you hear religious mass murderer what many people think of is jim jones and the jonestown massacre of 1978 in Guyana carried out by a popular American preacher known as Jim Jones. Not many people think of Credonia Emwerinde. Not many people think of the Kanungu massacre. I mean as a true crime freak myself, learning about the Kanungu massacre and the uh, Credonia Emwerinde and the uh, Joseph Kibwetere, not seeing it represented in the true crime community as large as it is, I was like no! Why? Why does the Jonestown massacre get so much attention as compared to the Kanungu massacre? Because one thing that is a fact here is the Kanungu massacre was way more deadlier than the Jim Jones massacre. And today, we will be talking about the mastermind of the Kanungu massacre, an unsung serial killer slash mass murderer slash priestess of darkness slash femme fatale, Credonia Mwerinde. But not to take away from the Jonestown massacre, Jim Jones himself was as deadly as he comes. He was a religious court leader who reigned supreme during the 1950s and the 1970s in America. Jim Jones started this religious movement in America called the People's Temple and then moved all his followers, all 900 of them, into Guyana, another country, and settled in a remote area where he named it Jonestown. Now all his followers begun to live there. They built an entire community in Jonestown and begun living there with him as their leader. But while he was in Guyana, he was still facing scrutiny. The American government was still on his case and they had, at the time, reached out to the Soviet Union with hopes that the Soviet Union would grant them exodus, a space for them to also move there and you know, exist as a cult. But the Soviet Union did not really give them the eye and the Guyanian government is also trying to get him to leave too. While the American government is not welcoming him back to America with all his shenanigans. So Jim Jones' hands were tied. He could no longer stay in Guyana. He could not go back to America and definitely the place that he had in mind to go to, they were not giving him a chance. So his reign was clearly at risk because what is a court leader without his congregation? And what is a congregation without a place to exist? So invariably, Jim Jones knew his time was up. And at a certain point, he would have to let his people go. Except this man did not. On the 18th of November, 1978, Jim Jones held a whole congregation of all his followers. He held it like some kind of a concert and encouraged them to take their life by drinking a poisonous substance that contained cyanide. In a tape that they found, it was said that Jim Jones told him that they have to do this act and, and they should see it as a revolutionary suicide and not just any other kind of suicide. He was able to convince them that the United States were on their neck, that they are going to throw bombs at them, that they are going to shoot at them, that the haters and the people who did not like their organization were going to attack them and kill them all and that this was the only way that they could do it and do it correctly. And for some reason he was able to convince all 909 members of his cult to poison themselves. Although it was later learned that some were injected and some were shot. So all 909 of them with 300 of them children were all found laying dead on the floors of Jonestown, including Jim Jones himself. Now, on November 1978, Credonia M. Waring Day would be in Uganda, a 27 years old married beautiful woman living with her seventh husband or sixth husband or maybe fourth husband and running a flourishing bar where she sells drinks and other kinds of alcohol. But it was almost as if Credonia was watching the Jonestown massacre and sipping a glass of wine and then she turns to the devil and say, is this it? Is this what you call a massacre? <laughs> and then she laughs and goes, hold my beer. Let me show you how it's done. For some bizarre reason, the end of Jim Jones turns out to be the beginning of Credonia Emwerinde. And boy, did she take mass murdering to another level. Jim Jones killed 909 people. Credonia killed nearly 3,000 people. 
if not for, you see, the amount of casualties from the Kanungu massacre is still not known up to now. But record had it that it might have been around 3,000 people. But the police themselves believe that it could have been more. And this is why she should be one of the worst religious cult leader ever lived. And the worst part is, unlike Jim Jones who died with his cult members, there is a very high chance that Credonia is still somewhere alive today. But the problem with Credonia Emwerinde and the Kanungu massacre is the credibility of this whole tragedy. It's like, who do we accredit it to? Who did this thing? If you ask an average person who is familiar with the story from the onset, they will tell you it's Joseph Kibwetere. In fact, when I did this story on my TikTok, it went viral and a lot of Ugandans came to my DM and they came to my comment section telling me, Credonia was innocent, Credonia did not do anything, she was a victim too, it was all Joseph Kibwetere, this boy does not know what he's saying, Joseph Kibwetere was what we were told growing up, a lot of Ugandans told me that and to be fair, when I started learning about the Kanungu massacre and I was doing my research, I started off writing Joseph Kibwetere, like as a writer, I began my my story with Joseph Kibwetere, but the deeper I got into the research, the clearer it was that Joseph Kibwetere was a pawn. Credonia Mwerinde was the queen. She was the mastermind of this whole tragedy. She was the brains behind it. It's funny that there's a chance that she may have committed this mass murder without even breaking her fingernails. All she had to do is give the orders or snap her fingers and 3,000 people would be wiped off the surface of the earth. And that was exactly what happened. But unlike Jim Jones who was actually thinking he was doing a service to the world by, you know, preaching God's words and drawing people to the kingdom, Credonia couldn't give a fuck. Credonia couldn't care less. Credonia's aim was money. It was confirmed by her husband who said the only thing Credonia liked was money. Money was the only thing that kept her happy. Even before she joined the movement or before she decided that she was going to start a, a church, she had a business like we've talked about she was in a flourishing bar and she was making money and the husband said it kept her very happy until the business crumbled and the reason why it crumbled was because of her greed and also because of the fact that she is a born serial killer so it was said that credonia had a special guest come to her bar and the guest was actually on his way on, on the road he was traveling somewhere where he stopped at the very flourishing infamous bar and then he got there and for some reason the next day he was missing but his car was still parked along the road but people around the neighborhood said they saw credonia cleaning off what looks like blood from the floors of her restaurant or bar whatever it was and slowly they began to add one plus one saying wait this guy was here yesterday night and now he's missing and now we are seeing credonia cleaning blood from the floors of her bar something is not adding up Although some people say they also saw her burning something that smelled like flesh at the back of that same restaurant and when they asked her what she was burning, she said rotten meat that got spoiled from the fridge. At the time, it made sense because she had a bar or restaurant but after this incident of the Kanungu massacre, people are beginning to look back at that moment and go, did she really burn meat? Was it really an animal meat or was it a human meat? Maybe the guy who people said was missing. Maybe that was who she was burning. However, nobody could prove anything at the time. So all they could do was live with their suspicion. But then people stopped patronizing her bar. And that was how her business crumbled. And according to her husband, she was really unhappy and frustrated with the fact that she wasn't making much money again. It was at that point she decided that she was going to join the Catholic dorm and um, become a reverend sister and hopefully begin her own congregation. And that was exactly what she did. Credonia was someone who came from a well-to-do family and I think that is where her love for money and her fear for suffering came from. 
her father was known to have a very big estate in Kanungu and it had lots of buildings but the only problem was she was a woman she was female and she had about three to four elder brothers who were in line to inherit those property and she didn't have a, a court in it she didn't have a say so as a woman she had to go on to get married and figure out a life with her husband so clearly she came from wealth and she couldn't just imagine herself going into poverty and that was why money was important to Credonia and invariably was the biggest inspiration behind starting this occultic movement. It wasn't because she really cared about anybody making heaven. She never did. She knew she was a demon. At least Jim Jones kind of sounded delusional. You could tell from the way he carried his court, from the way he ran his court, he actually thought he was doing something for the Lord. So that was one thing. But for Credonia and Wearing Day, this woman knew she was gonna born in hell from the onset and she didn't care. All she wanted was to get the money and take people with her to that hellfire except the people went there first before her so when Credonia crowned herself a reverend sister because clearly nobody ordained her she joined a group of the frocked reverend sisters who might have been actual reverend sisters there were two of them Ursula Kumehangi and Angela Mugisha so these two were the frocked reverend sisters and I think they somehow met Credonia and the three of them formed a small court at first and the court was dedicated to the Virgin Mary. So these three reverend sisters, they already begun their court on their own independently, but that court wasn't meeting any success. It wasn't getting the attention that Credona really wanted. Credona really wanted to form a court where she would have followers, you know, just the way you want to have an Instagram account and have lots of followers, or just the way you want to build a YouTube account and have lots of subscribers. That was what Credona wanted. She wanted to use the religious manipulation to get a lot of followers that would clearly feed her, clothe her, house her, and make her rich. And so she started her plan slowly. She started with the three reverend sisters and she saw that that was not exactly giving her what she wanted. She was like, no, I want it big. And the problem with why that sect did not work, the reason why the old reverend sisters small cult did not gain as much followers as they wanted was because of one thing. They were women and Credonia knew that was a problem. Credonia knew that was the issue. The fact that these were three women or the fact that she was a woman, she knew she was not going to get the attention that she required for what she really had in mind to do. She knew that as a woman, many people would not take her seriously. She knew as a woman in this religious pastor business, they would probably mostly ignore her and she was aware of that. And so she needed a man. This is where Joseph Kibwetere comes in. Credonia needed a man to put in the forefront of this movement because people will believe a man. Nobody will listen to a woman. She just needed a man that she can manipulate. And Joseph Kibwetere was just the perfect person. It was almost as if she was right in the fact that she claimed the Holy Spirit directed her to pick Joseph Kibwetere to lead the movement of the restoration of the Ten Commandments. Except it was the devil who led her. But it didn't really have to be the devil because there was something that I actually come to notice and even from the research I got, I could see how they picked him. I could see how uh, Joseph Kibwetere was an open choice. You don't need the Holy Spirit to tell you that Kibwetere is the person that you can actually use to start a movement. It was just obvious. Joseph Kibwetere was not unpopular. He was quite popular. He was known in his church and he was known in the community because he had his hands in politics. He had tried to run for office a few times but you know he wasn't very successful with it. So he was known in the political scene. He was known in his community. He had a reasonable amount of wealth. He had an estate and then he was also known in his church. Another thing again and I think this is where Credonia and the two witches figured out that Joseph Kibwetere was the one that they could easily manipulate or they could easily convince to think that the, the Virgin Mary asked them to come and meet him to lead the movement. The reason why is because eight years before they confronted or before they approached um, Joseph to start this movement, Joseph Kibwetere had announced publicly that he had a vision 
from the Virgin Mary. Clearly, these three Reverend Sisters were forming a cult led by the Virgin Mary. So it kind of tallies. It was like, who do we meet now that is going to lead our cult? And they'd be like, okay, oh, this man called Joseph Kibwete, he posted on Facebook many years ago that he had a vision from the Virgin Mary. So let's reach out to him. Let's see. He also has money. Let's meet him. If we tell him that we are all Reverend Sisters and we also had the same vision, he's going to probably fall for it. And that was what they did. Knowing that Joseph Kibwetere had announced that he had had a vision from the Virgin Mary years ago, they used that as a line of discussion to manipulate him. So one day in 1989, these three women approached Joseph Kibwetere on his way out from church and they told him that we have a message from the Virgin Mary for you. And he was like, oh, three reverend sisters have a message from the Virgin Mary from me? Yo, like he took them to his house they all sat down and the women explained to him that the Virgin Mary told them. Now, by the women, I mean Credonia. Let's be clear here. There were three women, but only one woman was the one, you know, getting visions from the Virgin Mary. And that was our Credonia and wearing day. So, yeah, that is important. So, Joseph Kibwetere was a very quiet, peaceful young man who was, you know, very religious. So, he was a perfect person for this. When this woman came and told him about the vision and also recalled his own vision, maybe he forgot he announced it. So it was almost like maybe they came to tell him that, did you ever have a vision in 1984? And he'll be like, oh, I did. How did you guys know? Forgetting that he had announced it and that's how they pretty much figured out. They convinced Kipo Etere and as luck and manipulation would have it, immediately Joseph Kipo Etere was like, I will join this cult and I will lead the restoration of the Ten Commandments. Joseph Kibwetere accepted. Now, part of their claim was that the Virgin Mary told them to tell Kibwetere to house them, to take all three Reverend Sisters into his house. Wow. And guess what? He agreed. Yay! Along with his wife, Teresa Kibwetere, who is also a very religious person, but a very quiet an observant woman. Now, we're going to talk about Teresa Kibwetere too, and she has a very important role to play because she was the one who saw right through Credonia and she tried to stop her husband, but damn, Credonia got a hold on him. Like, Credonia was like, Sorry, ma'am, this man is mine now. Go get you a new man. So, when Joseph Kibwetere accepted to house Credonia and the other three witches, the wife was like, okay, I mean, if it's what the Virgin Mary wants, why not? So let's 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 give it a try. And that was how Credonia packed a load. The Ursula also packed a load. I don't know about the other one. That one is not really mentioned all the time. It's as if that one had her own place and she had her own things going for her. So majorly the, the Reverend Sisters that were so into it was Ursula and um, Credonia. But there was a third one and there were a few other people, but you know, they were mostly more active. So when Credonia moved into Joseph Kibwetere's house, that was when the demon in her began to manifest. Now, let's be clear here. Credonia had convinced Kibwetere that she gets visions from the Virgin Mary. She communicates with the Virgin Mary, that the Virgin Mary talks to her, that sometimes she will start, you know, acting up like the way they do it in movies. She will just create an episode for herself and act like uh, the Virgin Mary just told her something and then she will say it and they'll be like, oh! <gasps> Wow, you know, they'll be like, they'll be shocked, like, girl, wow, you, you, that, that just happened. So when Credonia was in Joseph Kibwetere's house, according to Kibwetere's wife, um, Joseph Kibwetere had never hit any of his children. He had never beaten his wife. He was a very nice and easygoing person. But when Credonia came, things just changed even in Joseph Kibwetere's household. Credonia would start having visions and giving rules, giving rules and regulations. Like this woman is giving rules and regulations in Joseph Kibwetere's house, telling them what to eat, what not to eat. Sometimes she would even march into the Joseph Kibwetere's matrimonial bed and tell him not to sleep with his wife. Now, there was also some claims that Credonia came into Joseph Kibwetere's bedroom where the wife was and said that the Virgin Mary told her that Joseph Kibwetere should sleep with the Reverend Sisters, also with the wife. Now, I don't know if that eventually happened, but the wife actually did say that Credonia would come into their bedroom and say that she wants to sleep there and that it was the Virgin Mary that told her to do so. 
you can imagine. It's unclear if Joseph did it, but ah, uh, I mean, I won't be surprised. But that was not even all. Like this woman would give rules, would starve them, tell them that sometimes they should be eating once a day, and sometimes she even told them to not speak. Like they would be in the house and not talk. Credonia claimed that the Virgin Mary told them to do so and they all did so, everybody in the household. But sometimes Joseph's children will revolt and so Credonia will fight at them, try to beat them, even ask Joseph to beat the kids, that the kids were misbehaving and acting inappropriately. And it was said that Joseph also beat his children because Credonia asked him to do so. Wow. At the same time when she was in Joseph Kibwe Terry's house, they had already begun their outreach. They were already reaching out to people in the community, talking about their movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments, trying to convince people to join. And slowly with time, Joseph was the one actually in the forefront of this uh, uh, outreach. He was the one doing the talking. He was the one recruiting other people. He was even able to convince some Reverend Fathers from his church to leave the church and join him in this movement. And some of them actually did. He even went as far as registering their organization as an NGO, like he registered their court as an NGO. And so he was the one with the finances. And some of these new recruits of members joining their court, he gave them a space in his own compound to live because he had a very big compound. He had estate, he had rooms, he had places that people, people could stay. So his membership and their movement was growing with time from 100 to 200 members. At the same time, it was said that they were also causing nuisance in the community, that sometimes there would be a fight between the court members and some members of the community. And the people in the community where Kibwe Terry had lived were really getting tired of these people's new occultic movement. So with the help of Teresa Kibwe Terry, who was also tired of Credonia in her house giving orders, she joined forces with members of the community to kick the movement out of their community. But what she didn't know was that her husband too was going to leave. So when Teresa and the community members were successful enough to get this Credonia and her people out of the community, Joseph Kibwete rejoined. So where would they go from here? Mm -mm, chill, the story just started getting interesting. Remember I told you that uh, Credonia had a well-to-do life, that her father had a big estate in Kanungo, but she can't inherit it because she had elder brothers who were in line to inherit it. Well, that was where she went. She took all her members and went to her father's estate to settle. But how come she went to her father's estate to settle when she had elder brothers who were in line to inherit it? To shock you to know that for some reason, all those years, this woman has been planning to get that estate. Credonia is a very, very intelligent devil. Like, she had probably seen that this day would come. She had probably seen that she would need a place to stay. You see, unlike Jones himself, who did not plan ahead where to live, Credonia knew that at a certain point, she's going to need a place to keep all her followers. A place that she can say is her own. She had even known this before she even approached Joseph Kibwetere. So with that knowledge in mind, she started killing her brothers one by one, allegedly. Well, I mean, can we say allegedly again? I mean, she kind of did. All her brothers and the male children who were in line to inherit her father's estate suddenly died. And so, she was now the next person to inherit it. How? If she did not kill them, then how? Like, I mean, wow. This woman, this woman was ahead of her time. She knew what she was doing. And she packed all her members, all her congregation, and went to Kanungo, the estate her father left behind and settled there. Along with uh, leaders, including the um, Joseph Kibwetere, some other um, defrocked uh, reverend fathers and a few other reverend sisters too, with the, I think the Ursula and the other ones. So she had a panel of leaders who were leading the people, who were their followers. And one of the biggest tool that Credonia and Joseph Kibwetere used to draw these people was to tell them that the world was coming to an end. Now they had their first prediction, I think somewhere in 1991, that they predicted that the world was going to end. And so it attracted many people. They were like, wow, wow, these people, they know when the world is going to end. And so she urged them to join a cult to be safe. She also urged them to sell their properties and bring the money to her so that they were all, you know, 
make it to heaven so that was like the tool she used in attracting her congregation but she tried it three good times and i think it was the fourth time that she knew that this old trick is not going to work anymore so the first time she told them that the world was going to end she got really a lot of followers she got many followers and they came a lot of these poor people sold their properties and brought the money to her government to her team of leaders however when that time reached for the world to end she will eventually now send a letter and tell them that the virgin mary has postponed it as giving them time to repent and they'll be like oh thank god so we have enough time and so she predicted another date again and i think that should be 1992 or 1994 yeah she predicted another date again that the world would end and the followers more people came they're like wow you know the the followers are the ones even now doing the evangelism telling people you need to come and join us so god has pushed the end of the world to this year it was supposed to happen two years ago but he has pushed it now because he wants to give you people time so you guys should better come and join us and that was how our followers were just increasing from 100 to 200 to 300 to 400 eventually this woman had nearly 5,000 followers she had nearly 5,000 followers before instagram became a thing this woman was already having 5,000 followers and she housed many of them in her father's estate although some were living within the community there because you know not many of them could live in the estate i mean it's 5,000 so she had uh, they had a really good amount of following however when the second prediction happened and it was time for the world to end it didn't end she gave up another excuse again and they were like ah ah now wow this world not gonna end why is she changing her story then she predicted another one the third one which was supposed to be the year 1999 yep she predicted it to be 1999 and that was when they were like wow this it makes sense 1999 is very close to 2000 so this actually does look like the end of something so people were like intrigued they were like wow wow by 1999 december it's going to end wow like i'm in so more people came in and she urged them to sell their properties sell your properties and bring the money to us and that was like the scam that she was using and these villagers would sell their cows their lands their houses and they'll bring the money to credonia and wearing it eventually when 1999 came and um, december reached and the world did not end the people were like what the actual f is going on here this woman is playing us the people started having their senses they're like what's she doing many of them started requesting for their money back many of them started requesting for their properties back many of them started saying okay you know what i'm out of here many of them started leaving she started losing followers because I mean, it's getting too much. Is the world going to end or not? Like, is this woman playing with us? We've sold all our property. We've sold everything. When are we going to the heaven? When is God coming? The, the followers began confronting Credonia and the, the leaders. Some of the leaders in a, in a panel, I think one or two of them left because they were like, what is going on here? This woman that is getting a message from the Virgin Mary, why is it not happening? They started seeing her for the fraud that she was. However, like I said, this woman had oh she always had a backup plan so when the 99 came and the world did not end she told them that she miscalculated that she meant the year 2000 by december at this time many people were like ah bullshit however some people still stayed some people were still there like almost 3000 were still there she still had almost 3000 followers left oh and for some reason those 3000 followers would have wished they had left earlier When this woman said the world was going to end by December 2000, she started making preparations as early as January, February, March. She started buying food, animals, like with the money that they've all contributed, she was using part of it to create an occasion. And they're like, wow, we need to prepare ahead of time. Like we're going to prepare early. Like we're not going to be late. It's going to happen in December, but we're going to prepare so much in March. And the people are like, wow, yes, wow wow we're going to finally get to that heaven that we've been waiting for we're finally going to be chosen she told them that they're going to go into a church and uh, uh like the noah's ark where all of them will be so that when rapture happens um it will not affect them i think that was like the idea that when rapture happens it won't affect them or 
that they will go to heaven from there when god comes he will take all of them to heaven now by this time already by the early january of 2000 this woman had already begun killing her followers like people know the kanungu massacre to be the church burning but not many people know that there were other people who had been killed three months before that final church but in fact the church explosion was the final straw this woman had orchestrated organized she had even made the members dig their graves she told them to dig things that people should dig like they were digging and they didn't know what they were digging now the first group of people that were found in a separate uh, distant mass grave still in that kanungu compound were said to have been fed and poisoned and they became so tired and slow but you know to finish them off whoever killed them under the order of credonia was said to have used stones and sticks smashing their heads heavily and then dumped their body in septic tank and uh, under a, a hole in one of the houses it was said that nearly 800 to a thousand dead bodies were found in separate mass graves different mass graves in that compound and the worst part is the police were very sure that there were more mass graves but they did not have the money and the capacity to you know dig up everywhere so the places that they could dig and and it wasn't like three feet mass grave hole it was nearly in a nine feet a whole six feet nine feet hole that they buried these people so they had to get a massive manpower to dig and dig and dig with hands not even a tractor so they couldn't even probably even get the tractor to dig so they had to dig and be careful to retrieve all the bodies that they could find and the police were sure that there were more bodies but they, they could not get all of them so in total this woman had already begun had wiped out nearly uh, 800 to a thousand of her followers already in one corner like she had kept them and killed them silently and quietly and buried them so on the 17th of march 2000 it was said that uh credonia and the entire governing team had um gone to buy cows buy food buy drinks and told the followers to kill cook and they ate it was like a festive period a lot of them were like so happy they were excited she led all of them into a church in the same compound a very long church now, in this church, they had already bought fields, like jerry cans of fields. It was said that the jerry cans of fields were like lined up, and some of them were also poured on the ground somehow. I don't know why they did not perceive it. And um, some said like uh, the it was the whole drum of fuel that was at one end and at another end. So whatever it was, there were jerry cans of petrols in the hall, and the people were probably. I mean they were too blind to even see the signs they were following their leader's order so they didn't think this was what would happen it was said that these each members were given uh, a lighter or a matches yeah a matches to hold they dressed up after they finished eating and they were all lined up into the church and they were convinced that this church is where they're going to be when the rapture happened and it's going to be like the noah's ark and that something bad is about to happen that all of them being here is going to make them safe when all of them were inside the church uh, somebody sealed everywhere with nails and armors the doors were sealed the windows were sealed it was like everywhere was sealed it was like the Noah's Ark all over again almost 779 members of the the cult were in the in the church with the lighters and the church was being sealed from the outside now some sources said that while they were in the church it was sort of dark and so someone just felt the need to turn on the light like in the matches to just see something and that was it <laughs> and it was said that the fire was so bad that some people's skulls were exploded and people could smell burning flesh from afar the people in the community could see the fire burning for months it was a horrible stench of human flesh everywhere some people confirmed that uh joseph kibwetere and credonia were not there these two people were definitely not in that building but there were some other 
there was a, a reverend sister was in it and a, a priest was also in it that they were able to identify so i don't know how smart those two people were or how stupid they were but you know those people were the ones inside and it was said that those two people were the ones the the two people the priest and reverend sister, were, were the ones who instructed the people that if they light their matches that the holy spirit would take them that when they go into the hall that should all turn on their matches so that the holy spirit so they would probably ascend into heaven i think that was what the words were and when they turn on the matches to go into heaven they literally literally went into hell and that was how they all burned to death maybe joseph kibwetere might have been inside but i doubt credonia was inside i i honestly doubt she's too evil to be inside she knew what she was doing all along and so that was it that was how it all happened and that was how they were able to accumulate all the dead bodies picked up from the Kanungu compound to be over 3,000 people. Probably she went back to the devil and she was like looking at Jim Jones like that's how you do a mass murder. She probably collected a wine bag from the devil and the devil is like this is my daughter, yeah this is my girl. It's so really sad and this is actually the unfortunate story of the Kanungo massacre as regard Credonia and wearing day and I know this video was quite long and I was really happy to share the story because I kind of know it offhand now and uh, it was really exciting to share if you're able to watch it from the beginning to the end then I appreciate you so thank you guys for watching and also don't forget to let me know your thoughts on the Credonia and wearing the Kanungo massacre story it would be nice to read your comments and hear your thoughts and what you think about this whole situation so thank you for watching